Christoph, well, he's an adventurer who makes his work, his hobby, and his adventure in the deep oceans. And of course, until the oceans run dry, used to be once upon a time, another way of saying forever. Planet Earth is covered 70% with water. Okay, uh, the average depth of the ocean is 12,000 feet. Most of the underwater images that you have seen in the last 50 some years in National Geographic Magazine, Discovery Channel, television, Jacques Cousteau, they've all been in less than 100 feet of water. And now, come on guys, is that gonna run? Yes, it's going to. 20,000 bites under the sea. This is what I do for National Geographic. I make pictures in water that's deeper than where you find the scuba divers. I use submersibles. This is a Russian submersible, and they do hang around cigarettes hanging out of their mouths, and they do all sorts of unhealthy things, but they also will dive. Uh, this is one of my camera systems out on the front of one of the Russian mirrors that we used in 1991 to make the Titanic IMAX movie with Stephen Lowe's company. Uh, I'm probably most known for my pictures of the Titanic from, uh, from that shoot. This was a pioneering effort where we used uh, two submarines, great big uh, underwater HMI lights, and another Canadian up here, that's uh, Jim Cameron, showed us all how to take that technology that we had worked on and developed and how to make money out of it on a movie called Titanic. This is probably my favorite picture out of the, out of the set. This is Stephen Lowe coming up over the, uh, the the bow of the Titanic, and up over to the uh, bridge, and this is the, the windows ha uh, hanging down from Captain Smith's cabin. The forward section, this is out in the debris field, one of those deck uh, benches everybody's always changing around on the, uh, the Titanic. <laughs> uh, down here, this is uh, engine, con uh, engine control here. This is the ship's telegraph saying, all stop for the ages. And then finally, we final shot out of here, we took both of the Russian uh, submarines cave diving. At 12,400 feet, we moved everything underneath the transom of the Titanic to make this picture of the starboard propeller, which is 23 feet across. Now, probably the two finest sailing warships we're ever gonna find in the world are located right out here in your backyard. These are the Hamilton and the Scourge, story that was a cover uh, back in 1983, uh, the ghost ships of the War of 1812. Uh, these ships are located in 300 feet of water. It's uh, fresh water, so you don't have any worms in there. They're in deep water, so you don't have any stir uh, storm uh, surges. And it's also what I considered, it's, uh, when I was nine years old, what a shipwreck should look like. The cannons are there, the cutlasses are mounted in place. Uh, the ship looks like you can sail it away. You've got the bones of the sailors down there. All of this that's um, kind of a reality that probably only exists very few places like in cold, deep water Canadian lakes. Uh, when we did this, the story in, uh, in 1982, we used a, uh, an oil field type robot. This is quite a large machine. Uh, this was our group from the Geographic at that point. We used this uh, Benthos ROV, this uh, RPV 430, also to do uh, the photography on the uh, Joe McGinnis uh, project on the Berdalban up in the Canadian Northwest. Uh, this was our search area, this is Canadian Forces Icebreaker, and this is a search area, and we were trying to do this in heavy ice, I think first and last time that that was ever done. Uh, we found the ship down at 340 feet. We then went out, that's, uh, established a camp on the ice, we operated our ROV out of here, we had a submersible, that's kind of a 96 large off the rack that you can wear, uh, this WASP unit with Phil Newton from CanDive. A lot of Canadian content in my talk. I just keep plugging that. Um, and here, down to 340 feet, is the man submersible photographed by the ROV over the, uh, the ship's wheel. Uh, another project I did with a lot of help uh, from Canada, uh, the Edmund Fitzgerald. Uh, worked with the uh, Canadian Navy, the Cormorant, uh, their summer submersible SDL-1, the Pisces-4, and again, Phil Newton, and this time we used one of his nude suits. Now the project that we had here was basically to recover the bell from the Edmund Fitzgerald, uh, put it in a museum in uh, upstate uh, Michigan as part of the memorial for the men that were lost on the ship, and then 
a, a replica bell with the names of the 29 men that were lost on the ship was then placed back on uh, top of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Uh, another type of wreck here, this is uh, a, uh, a Manila galleon uh, located quite fittingly about 60 miles from Manila. The ship went down in 1600. Uh, this wreck is only at 187 feet of water, but the divers can only spend a half an hour a piece down there and by this time, the uh, French divers that we were working with had given our little band from the geographic the name the Nintendo Divers because we sat on our butts all day and played the most expensive game that's, uh, of Nintendo anybody has ever seen, little robots going around and making these pictures. Uh, this wreck, the prime, can we turn the lights down a little bit because this is, uh, this probably looked a little bit better. Thank you. Uh, the most valuable thing on this wreck were the Ming Dynasty porcelains from 1600. And there's a little gold on there. And then here's a look, a lot of Southeast Asian pottery from 1600. Uh, that's about one third of the, uh, the Ming Dynasty porcelain. And we had the cannons and all the good stuff. The nice thing about this particular project, it was funded by uh, the French uh, oil company Elf. And then uh, everything here from uh, this site then went back to the Museum of Anthropology uh, in Manila and was not on sale at Southeast. Another project where we received help that's uh, from locally, from here in Canada, uh, Dan Nelson and Bob Doney from uh, this area developed a software that allowed us to scan the Arizona uh, out in Honolulu Harbor. And the, the water quality is so bad there that you really cannot see the ship very well, and this is the bomb damage that sank the Arizona that's uh, when, the Japanese, when the Japanese bombed it. This was run in the magazine about a year ago. First time for an image like this. We did pictures on the inside of the Arizona that's uh, with really small ROVs. As you can see here, size of the ROV compared to the telephone uh, in here. Uh, one of the things the National Park Service, which is in charge of this ship, is beginning to worry about the half million gallons of oil that's on board and the oil can, in effect, the Arizona is rusting away. And they're going to have to deal with that. Uh, this is the Admiral's cabin. This is the Admiral's uh, briefing table. And then it, there was a, a light over the briefing table, a chandelier. And then all these pictures are done remotely and then this was one of the chairs in the admiral's, uh, in the admiral's cabin, and you can see the, uh, the covering has been eaten away, and you can see the springs. Now, that is it uh, for shipwrecks. The thing that I am most interested in doing uh, for the geographic is animal life, and this is Alvin at depth of about 8,500 feet, and here's, uh, again, one of the mirrors down about 14,000 feet. And we're looking at hot water volcanic vents. And these are the vents that have all sorts of life that are springing up uh, around them that's uh, fed by a, a system of chemosynthesis. Now, this image here is from out in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, you have probably all have seen these vents. They have great big red-headed tube worms. And the, uh, Everything here is being made to go by a bacteria that can process the sulfur products that are, are coming up out of, the, out of the deep. And actually right now they figure that over 50% of the total biomass of this planet is involved in this bacteria uh, down in these vents. And this was unknown completely till 1977. This image is out of a, a film that is going to be out about next February, again working with Stephen Lowe. Uh, this film is on, it's, uh, the hot water vents and deep water animals. It'll be an IMAX release. You can see the black smokers, some of the smaller black smokers. You've got some very strange animals. This animal here lives in water that is hotter than the boiling point of water at sea level. It's not, it will live in water that's about 230, 240 degrees Fahrenheit. In the Atlantic, that's, uh, you don't have the red-headed tube worms, but you have millions and millions of blind shrimp. Uh, these shrimp have a little spot right here in the middle of their back, and this seems to be a heat sensor that allows them to find the hot water vents where the bacteria uh, is growing, and then they crop the bacteria, and some of the larger shrimp right here then eat the smaller ones. Uh, also in 1990, again, working with the, uh, the Russians, we uh, took their Pisces submersibles, 
built in Canada, uh, that the Russians own, out to Lake Baikal. And we found the hot water vents at 1,200 feet in Lake Baikal. You can see the bacteria back here, and the predominant animal at the, uh, the sites are, are sponges. One of the things that I felt would be a great thing to do would be to treat deep sea animals like terrestrial uh, animals and bait them into uh, submersibles. So we started this project uh, in Bermuda in the mid-1980s. We named it after B Mr. Beebe right, Dr. Beebe right here. This, uh, this is the uh, bathysphere that went down to a half mile. That's Otis Barton that funded it. And the idea was that the sea mountain that Bermuda is located on attracts a lot of animals. And if you want to, this is kind of like a layer cake. And if you want to see animals from 2,000 feet, you go down to 2,000 feet and you bait for them. If you want to see 4,000 foot animals, you go down to that depth. When we tried this, it took 17 minutes for the first large shark to come in, and it was so large it ate the whole bait can. So we, it was like Jaws, we had to go back and get a bigger bait can. This was the lead picture for the story in the magazine that saw uh, these sharks went up to 15 feet, and we did this with a remote camera that we could trigger from the uh, submersible. Here we tried to hand feed the sharks, which we found later was not a good idea if you see the size of some of them. But this little fellow is eating his way up to the hydraulic lines on the arm. Um, here we have uh, two of the six gill sharks down at 4,000 feet. They ran into each other with their mouths open, and they did a little wrestling. We then uh, moved on to, uh, to the Cayman Islands. I was working with Eugenie Clark on this project. We did some, uh, we had now a, a macro camera that allowed us to do a picture like this. We went to Monterey, California, uh, worked the canyon there, and then finally wound up doing Suruga Bay, Japan. And that's Mount Fuji back there. This is one of our ROVs from the Geographic. And we did a uh, story that's uh, that with David Dubolet working down here in the shallows. I was using ROVs to about 850 feet here. And then we took submersibles down in the deep water some of the shots from the, uh, from the ROV. Uh, this is about 550 feet in the middle of the night. It's, we had our lights on. This bristle mouth, which is a deep water fish, was up uh, in, you know, during the middle of the night, came over to the light, and was eaten by the, uh, the eel here. Wonderful. Uh, this, this is um, a six foot kind of toe to toe Japanese spider crab. They go to 12 feet toe to toe. And it's a face off with one of our smaller ROVs. <laughs> Uh, David Dublay calls these sumo hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> now here I'm on the submarine and I'm down around 1,200 feet and this is a, a fish with the worst case of hemorrhoids ever seen in fishdom. Uh, also got the largest animal ever seen out of the window of a submersible. This is a 28 foot Pacific sleeper shark. Now the, the biggest toothed sharks on the planet are down in deep water. The largest great white ever measured, measured less than 21 feet. This is 28 feet. It makes a great white look like a guppy. So it shows a lot about, we don't know what's happening down in the food chain in, in deep ocean. And then we looked at how to use smaller uh, boats and, and smaller remotes to take the place of the submersibles to work in deep water. We tried the idea out in the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, work down to about 500 feet there. This is about 300 feet. These are salp, uh, salp chains. These are brow fish that eat the salps. Um, this is about an 80 pound halibut. I've got baited into my ROV down here. It also brought in a Pycnopodia starfish and the, the halibut was unhappy and tried to rip an arm off. We then had this system worked out pretty well. We used an 87 foot ship to go out to the Marshall Islands to a place called Rongelap. And this is a, now thanks to the bomb testing of Bikini 70 miles away back in 1954, this island got a big dosage, that's uh, a big dosage of radiation. In fact, Greenpeace took them out of their, uh, the last thing that you did with your ship before it was sunk by the French commandos down in, uh, in New Zealand. But in the end, nobody could live there. So we went there to look to see just what was happening with the fish, because this is kind of Jurassic Reef. Uh, this is the shark's view the, from the ROV of what the divers look like in a cage. But we used a new system called rope cam that allowed us to do the remote work that we were doing with a submersible down, and this is now 2,500 feet, and this is a six gill shark at 2,500 feet. This is done on videotape. Uh, this is a, 
well, again, one of those very, very large Pacific sleeper sharks. Uh, this piece of bait, give you some idea of size, is four foot. It's a four, four, four foot piece of barracuda. And we took the pro uh, project down to New Zealand, and here we have a picture of a, a, um, a 2,500 feet of about a four foot squid attacking a shark on camera. Now, if we can run the video, we're gonna have some motion on some of this. Okay. Now, we have a little sound. Good. <laughs> now, this is out of that scene where we have the, the two six gills trying to munch on each other. And now here we have Eugenie Clark describing. Seeing something like this makes you realize that there are probably lots of things down here, big things that we don't know about. There'll always be more to learn. There'll always be more surprises, more sea monsters. And then this is a quick look at what we do at the rope camp. Um, this is life to two miles. This is a, a camera package you're gonna see here in a moment. This is a 51 foot boat that we're using down in Monterey Canyon. We had three of these packages on the boat. Uh, we took them out, uh, to water was 12,000 feet deep. We have a mini DV camera, we have the lights on here, and then we have tw uh, 12 gallons of enzyme enhanced bait. This is over a thousand times more attractive than just having the meat on there. Uh, the cameras go down, they work a light dark circle that uh, for every 15 minutes the cameras are on for a minute and a half. And then the cameras work for about eight hours, we have three of them, we basically have 24 hour coverage uh, with the camera system. This is the scene from the uh, six gill shark in, in Rongelap, and we pulled out that still picture off the head that you're gonna see popping out of the dust cloud here in a moment. And there we go. Then here we have a look again at a big Pacific leaper shark. Uh, that bait is four, foot, is four foot long. This shark is something over 20 feet. Again, it's bigger than a great white. And you just don't see these that's uh, Fortunately, I guess, maybe up there at the beach. <laughs> yeah. But more and more, it's beginning to show us that we don't know what's happening down in deep water. This is start to see. I mean, the real large animals, uh, real large animals like this. This is the Sidicus. Uh, these go up to 11 feet. These are off the coast of California and uh, uh, down, I guess, as far south as Peru. Uh, this is at 1,800 feet. And this is a black and white low light level camera. And we have one of these guys comes in. He spends about nine minutes just kind of nicely chewing away on the bait. We're not gonna show you all nine minutes of this. But this is very, very low light. They don't seem to like light when the light comes on. And this next scene is down at 2,400 feet and it's a color camera. And the light goes on and I'm out of here. Uh, this is a look right here of the shark coming in and the squid attacking the shark, and this has never been seen before. And by the way that that squid wrapped up the, uh, the shark so that the, the, the jaws don't work, I mean, the squid's done this before, and I saw other squid, uh, sharks down there that had bites in the back. I mean, squid is going right for the, uh, the cord. All right, this is down at a mile in New Zealand. Part of what I'm getting out of this right now is that I'm getting a spike of life at five and 6,000 feet. I'm getting more life at five and 6,000 feet than I'm getting at any point on the way down once I'm out of the surface, out of the surface. And it doesn't seem to matter whether it's the Western Pacific or the Eastern Pacific, the animals are different. Like here you've got these uh, large black eels, uh, the little white parasitic, and you've got some black sharks. Uh, this is also down in a mile. This is the same location with the camera looking down. Now, in, this ne uh, in the next scene here, we've taken the bait off. We're just using our, our, chemical, our chemical bait. And the eels are just coming in and just kind of puffing on it. 
Uh, we had 27 instance, instances of predation. And here you have one of the big black guys taking a little white guy to lunch. Right here. And this is a scene all the way across the Pacific Ocean in Monterey Canyon. This is 6,000 feet down. And this is not done with Photoshop. These are all the animals were there when the lights went on. Uh, another thing we got out of that, that great big uh, rat tail fish right there, Giganticus, has only been known to 3,000 feet. With the, uh, the images we have here, that's, uh, we doubled the range of the animal. And along with all the other things we're doing right now with the planet, it probably is not a bad idea that we should start looking to see just what is the food chain in deep water because we're starting to fish down there. And so far, this has not been a very successful thing. Um, this is down at two miles. That is a seven foot cusk eel. That's the largest cusk eel anybody's ever seen. And I can tell on this that bucket is exactly one foot across. There. So like the, uh, the orange ruffy from down in New Zealand, it was a great fishery for a couple years, but then they found out that the fish lived to be over 100 years old, and they had to be 28 years old before they really mated, and it knocked off the fishery in a couple years. We did the same thing with uh, sable fish and black cod about 20 some years ago off the west coast of the United States. So we haven't done very well with the surface stocks on this planet, and we know something about them, and we don't know much about what's happening down here, but we're going in there and starting to catch. So we should be doing some studying of this. And you're on. <laughs>